All glory be to Christ. That's what our lives should be, shouldn't they? Every waking moment, we should try and glorify Christ as Christians. I was going to ask you a question. Have you ever been in a room or a meeting where you've had to introduce yourself to strangers? I don't know about you, but I absolutely hate that sort of thing. Uh, you know, where you go around the room in a circle and have to give your name and a bit about yourself to everyone in the group. So a few years ago, I went to um, an Apple conference in London uh, for work, and this exact thing happened to be. There was five or six people there, and we started going round. I was thinking, they're definitely going to get to me next. I'm, I'm going to be next. I don't know what to say. You know, I'm racking my brain, thinking what to say. People were saying, hi, my name's David. Uh, you know, I'm one of seven. Or, hi, my name's... John, I've got a YouTube channel or whatever. Um, some said, yes, I'm Josh, I play cricket. And all this time, I was just racking my brain. Like, what am I going to say? What am I going to do here? My turn finally came round. And bear in mind, I'd just become a Christian at this point. Um, I said, hi, my name's Joel. I, I play the ukulele. And without thinking, I just blurted out, and I'm a Christian. And uh, the look on these people's faces <laughs> just turns these like, bizarre shapes of like, amazement and shock and anger. Um, but I've been thinking about that a bit deeper these past few weeks, and it came to me that so many people are craving an identity, like something to sort of base their life on, especially younger people. Um, I was so nervous to say something about myself, and I think a lot of people are as well, because uh, we, we need to be and we want to be, I think, as humans, established in our identity as to who we are. Now, when asked to tell people a bit about themselves, it's almost like a mental block, I think. That's why we don't like it. We just sort of shrug and say, you know, well, I'm me. That's, that's it. And it's just this block. But only a few decades ago, I think people found their identity quite quickly. So being a part of like a local club or a sports team or having a job or being a parent, this is quite a natural thing. Um, these identities were commonplace. But in my generation, people aren't choosing these identities anymore. Like people don't identify with a club, they don't identify with a community of, of hardly any sort at all. And they're struggling to fit in, in anywhere. And it's really sad, because I think God has put into the heart of every human being a need to have a solid identity, you know, a place, a place to be. And when we find an identity, this makes us feel comfortable, you know, established and grounded. But when I looked at these people after I said I was a Christian, I thought to myself, you know, this is so sad. Your whole basis of who you are, like your whole self-worth, is based off a YouTube channel or, or cricket or something. You know, it's a sports team or your job. So my point is that we're called to be more than that. We are called as humans to be more of just an identity than a YouTube channel or a cricket team or a parent or a personality trait. Because God says that we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. He says human beings are the pinnacle of his creation. Surely that calls you more to something than just your job. <clears throat> to have something define you, as trivial as your job or your personality, is kind of selling yourself short a little bit. Because as Christians, we know who we are. You know, First Peter, second, First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. But would you rather go to your grave being a fun-loving workaholic? You know, for your choice, or something else so trivial. So God has put in the inbuilt desire to have an identity in us because he wants to place it in him. I'll say that again, and I'll let you think about it once I get some water, once again. So God has put an inbuilt desire to have an identity in us because he wants us to place it in him. That's why we're seeking an identity, because all humans are put with this puzzle piece in their heart to place it in Jesus. That's why we're created. So if you haven't given your life to Jesus, and by that I mean if you don't believe he lived and he died and he rose again, and the outcome of that is you're able to repent and turn to him, if you don't believe that, I'll ask you, where is your identity? Who are you? What is your purpose? That's all we're really looking for, I think, as humans, is a purpose. Who are you really, deep down? What defines you? <clears throat> the purpose of my talk is for anyone who has not put Jesus at the forefront of their life to do so today. You will not gain not only a new identity, but you'll be a whole new person. Just like Atta said, he was made a new creation. 
when he gave his life to Christ. You know, look at me, I used to be an angry, sad drug dealer six years ago. But now look at me, I'm up here. No, Christ has given me a new identity. This is what he does to people. I no longer stake my life on trivial identities like my race or my job or my interests or my family. I stake it in this. <clears throat> I am a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And that's nothing to do with what I've done. What did we just sing? All glory be to Christ. It's to do with he, who he is. God gives us the craving for an identity. The Holy Spirit leads us to the cross. Jesus makes us a new creation. <coughs> That's the wonder of the Trinity, isn't it? The mystery of the Godhead. See, these things I'm saying are worth far more than a sports team or a YouTube channel, just as I was saying before. So where is your identity? Who are you? Who are you? Really think about that today. It's not just your name, oh, I'm Joel. No, think about who are you? And as a Christian, I can claim things about my own identity that I'm told I am in the Bible. What am I? I'm a child of God. I'm a saint. I'm a friend of Jesus. I'm a herald of the truth. I'm a member of Christ's body. I am complete in Christ. I am free from condemnation. I'm hidden with Christ. <coughs> I am a citizen of heaven. I'm God's temple, I'm free from sin, I'm born of God, I am chosen for his workmanship. And wow, these things have been given to me because my hope is built on nothing less than his blood and his righteousness. Not my own doing, but of who God makes me into. So in the world, identities change, don't they? If you asked me when I was a child who I was, it would be a, a completely different answer to who I thought I was ten years ago, to who I am now. They're all changes. But another wonderful thing about planting your flag in God is that your identity never changes when you become a Christian. You are a Christian <coughs> today, and you'll be a Christian tomorrow. When you repent and believe in Christ truly, then no power of hell or scheme of man can ever pluck you from his hand. Why? Because God does all the saving. We don't work our way up to be saved. We don't do good things to balance the scales. Jesus saved me. If I saved myself, I'd lose my salvation every day. My salvation is not dependent on me. I don't want to give myself that sort of power. <coughs> it's dependent on Jesus and what he's done, his finished work. I have Jesus interceding, atoning, loving, pouring out new mercies every day. And this is why my identity is fixed and can never be changed. When I say pouring out new mercies every day, it's another bit of Christianese. I mean that I now can say I have the mercy of God given to me because I put my identity in Christ, in the cross. Because I'm now a Christian, I can safely say that God now shows mercy <coughs> on me. <coughs> Sorry, this always happens, you just have to bear with me. But yeah, he didn't before. He didn't show mercy on me before. I was a child of wrath before. Before I became a Christian. That's what the Bible describes me as. Destined for an eternal hell. Why? Because I offended him. I didn't thank him, I didn't obey his laws, I didn't want to get to know him, I lived my own life. I did it my way. And my identity was not found in Christ. Therefore, I had no mercy from God waiting for me in the afterlife. I was a child of wrath. That's terrifying, isn't it? When you think about that, a child of wrath. But because I have actively made a choice to say sorry <coughs> for my sin, and like Atta was saying, you can say it as many times as you like, but if you don't mean it, it's not going to happen. That divine exchange is not going to happen. You must believe what you're saying. It's not like a magic wand where you say, oh, I'm sorry, and then it all goes away. No, <clears throat> you've got to want it. You know, I live my own life. But I made a choice to turn away. And I now have mercies poured out on me every day. That's what that means. I can now run to God when I sin and say sorry, and I can be forgiven. So let me make it very clear. I'm saying that if you have not given your life to Christ, 
If you're not a Christian, if you don't stake your identity entirely in Jesus, then no mercy will be given to you. You are still dead in sin, a child of wrath. Again, terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying to be in that position. But when you're a Christian, <coughs> when you become saved, when you're born again, the joy, the peace, the love, the mercy that you feel is ever deepened, the more terrifying that thought becomes. Do you, does that make sense? The more you know that you were a child of wrath, the more you know how holy God is, the more joy you get when you realise what he's done and how he's pulled you out from where you were. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? So the more you know how holy he is, <clears throat> the more you can the more it deepens the joy, the peace, the mercy that you feel. Your purpose can no longer be trivial, but rooted in truth. You get a new identity. What are you? A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. What wonderful words they are, special possession. Have you ever been called that by anyone? Ever? But God calls you that when you come to him, a special possession. I'm not going to talk about identity politics, I always do. But I will make this one point, if I may. The further away we drifted, drifted from God as a culture, the more weight arbitrary identities now have on our life, how we interact and how we move within society. Race, gender, sexuality, personality, these are all characteristics of humanity. But have you noticed that these things have become some people's entire identities? They base their whole self off one of those birth-given traits. Have you noticed the U-turn from biblical truth? Go hand in hand with elevating menial birth characteristics into a complete, powerful identities, now with the power to even legislate in government. And that's really dangerous. That's what happens when we don't place our identity in Christ. We look for it in other places. And it's really dangerous. We must stake our identity in Christ. Let Jesus mould us into the people that he wants us to be. You know, he's waiting for you to turn back to him, for you to understand fully your position within the church and before God. Do you know that you don't have to understand who you are by dreaming it up yourself as well, or by picking an activity that you do? It's actually written in God's word who you are, Christian or not. So first establish this. Do you love, worship and fear the Lord Jesus Christ? If that's a no, then the Bible tells you your identity. 2 John 1.9 Everyone who goes on ahead <clears throat> and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Psalm 14.1 14, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. So again, that's a fearful and scary position, isn't it? for a non-believer to have as an identity, without God, corrupt, sinful. You know, we're enemies of God, who, the enemies of the God of the universe who wills all things before we become Christians. That's what the Bible explicitly teaches. And that's what the identity is of a non-believer. And if that's you, then I'll say what Jesus said, repent. You know, turn back to him, realise who you are. Realise that God himself made you. You're not just a husband or a mother or a cricketer or YouTuber, whatever you might answer to who are you, but you're much, much more than that. There is a supernatural realm that identifies you clearly and truthfully. When you fall on your knees in repentance and realise you're a sinner in the hands of a holy God, when that drives you to say sorry and make a decision to fear, to love, and to trust Jesus, then you're instantly made new. You can answer the who are you by saying, I'm a chosen people, I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation, I am God's special possession. So make that commitment today, and your life will be transformed, it really will. I mean, I'm, we're all living proof of that. Before we're Christians, we were totally different, I'm sure that Jesus transforms us into the people that he has chosen for us to be. And we will have a new, fixed and joyful identity. So, please stand as we sing <clears throat> about what Jesus does for us when we come to him. So it's called, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. I'm sure lots of us know it. But it says that he washed our guilty stain. 
So without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So because there's a fountain filled with blood from Emmanuel's veins, we are able to be forgiven. And that's a wonderful thing. That should cause us to be joyful and sing. So please, let's stand and sing. There's a fountain filled with blood.